new TB drug for children launched today. Unitec to introduce aptitude test for school leavers. And Prime Minister addresses mining related issues. This is National MTV News with Mary Batolo. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Tuesday's news. A new TB drug for children was launched today at Port Mosby General Hospital. The TB drug will be rolled out in Port Mosby for 12 months before being accessible to the rest of the country. Dr. Lucy John from the Health Department said the new drug is more child-friendly in terms of taste. It encourages children to take their medication on time. The new TB drug for children pilot project was launched today by PNG Pediatric Society in partnership with World Health Organization, National Department of Health, NCD Health, Palm General Hospital and ExxonMobil. Dr. Henry Welch, Pediatric Society President, who is also a doctor at Palm General Hospital, said the drugs were dissolvable and would be easy to be given to children. So the, the, the previous medications we might have to take a few pills break them in half and then maybe crush them and mix them with water and they can be bitter tasting so kids don't like it so you know sometimes you can go to the ward and you'll see kids screaming and kicking fighting to take some of these medicines so it's hard for a, a child any child to take any medicine so we're hopeful that this medicine will be a little bit easier I don't know if it'll be a panacea and fix everything but it, it's easier to dissolve and it tastes better so they're better formulated for children. Dr. Lucy John from National Department of Health says that reasons why children get TB in most cases was because their parents had it. But she says TB is curable and the new drugs is the government's next defense in reducing the number of TB in children. Out this new drug fair and then learn from the experiences that we are going to see within the 12 months and then make sure that we strengthen the program for the children, the TB program, and then make sure that if this drug is really liked and it's working very well and it's doing all the nice things for the children, that's what we want, that will replace the old medicine that we have. So at the moment, this is the phase now to, to find those, um, the challenges that the older drug is having and comparing it to the new drugs new combination of drugs and then make sure that it's best for us, then we roll it. Main donors of the pilot project rollout in Port Moresby, AusAid, will be supporting with a grant of 542,000 kina and will be partners in the rollout throughout the country. So the Australian government is working very closely with the National Department of Health and the other partners in TB control much more broadly. And we constantly are, you know, looking at the um, where Australia's investments can support the National Department of Health and the TB program more broadly. So that's, a, that's an ongoing, constant discussion. The TB drug has been used in three other African countries. Dr Henry Welsh wanted to make it clear that TB is curable and to take medication on time. Adelaide Xerox, Kari National, MTV News. Melanesian Trustee Services Limited has continued its support towards vulnerable children. Today, MTSL announced its support to a charity event that will be hosted by Life PNG Care this month. Life PNG Care is an organization that acts as an orphanage giving hope and a second chance at life to disadvantaged and vulnerable children and youth in the nation's capital. Melanesian Trustee Services Limited or MTSL General Manager Corporate Affairs and Governance Lawrence Stevens today presented a check of 15,000 kina to the director of Life PNG Care, Colin Pake. Life PNG Care will be hosting its annual charity dinner on August 19 to raise funds for its mobile education program. For Mr. Pake, it's all about the opportunity to change one child's life for the better. For me, I believe in a generation. You know, if we change a generation, we change a society and a nation. Uh, although we can have more advocacy on adults, but kids are the generation that we really need to look more close. While MTSL is platinum sponsor, the National Development Bank is major sponsor. Both organizations have supported Life PNG Care since last year when the initial charity dinner was held. 
like to do besides um, providing financial um, solutions for um, um, Papua New Guineans is also to look at impact projects around the community. And uh, one of the ones that um, sort of caught our attention was what Colin was doing with regards to looking after um, homeless children in Port Mosby. And we thought that was a great opportunity to help him out and help to see him grow from there. Kids who clearly should be at school but aren't at school, they're, they're on the street uh, looking for food, asking for people to assist them. And then you find individuals who realise how valuable a little bit of assistance to young people can be for the future of the country. As an NGO and faith-based organisation, Life PNG Care was able to enrol about 100 children into schools through its Strong and Piccanini Education Program this year from the support it received from generous individuals and corporate bodies. At last year's charity dinner, over 100,000 kina was raised. This year, Life PNG Care hopes to raise over 200,000 kina. For more information about the charity dinner, interested individuals and corporate bodies can contact Mr. Pake on phone number 7347-6302. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. The University of Technology is preparing to introduce a compulsory aptitude test for school leavers. The test is for grade 12 school leavers who wish to be considered for admission in all courses for 2017 and beyond. The aptitude test will be conducted on the 7th to the 9th of November this year. Dr. Ora Renagi, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, says the University's Council and Management have approved policies to ensure a fairer, more transparent selection process. The purpose is to ensure that only candidates who have the capacity to benefit from tertiary education are selected. We need to address our quality issues, so this exercise uh, is really to, to ensure that we are are taking quality students into, into the system. Each grade 12 applicant must pre-register with the Australian Council for Education Research or ASA website with the payment of a non-refundable test fee of 100 kina. Applicants should be able to open and complete an account and communicate with ASA regarding the admission number. Only candidates who have valid and current 2015 and 2016 ID cards and ASA admission tickets to be generated after payment of fees have been confirmed will be allowed to take the test at the allocated venue. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Deputy Governor for Central Province, Desmond Baira, today presented payment for Central Province students' fees currently attending the Institute of Business Studies. The payment is part of Governor Kilahauda's initiative in assisting Central Province students attending tertiary institutions, colleges and private-run colleges. The Deputy Governor of Central Province, Desmond Baira, today presented a cheque of 167,800 kina to the IBS. It is the first batch of payments for 84 confirmed Central students studying at the institution. We will, we have sponsored about 84 students and that is the amount that is uh, going to be presented today. We, that's the first batch and the second batch that is coming um, another, 60 another six, 60 students in which we will pay in the due course another 120,000. This is an ongoing program that was initiated by Central Province Governor Kila Hauda. Governor Hauda initiated the program in 2013, assisting parents in sending their children to colleges by paying 2,000 kina as parental component. The aim of the program is to develop the human capital of the central province for better outcomes for the future. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. Among stories after the break, today's question time in Parliament. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. Questions were raised in Parliament today about mineral and forestry rights that may have been signed over to a company that is planning to grow rice in the country. Kiranga Kua, member for Sinasina Yongumul, asked the Minister for Agriculture, Tommy Tomskol, to clarify this in Parliament today. 
Karanga Kua raised this supplementary question following questions raised about the delay in the Gabadi Rice project. I understand that um, in that same agreement, the state's rights in forestry, number one, in minerals, number two, and in oil and gas, number three, on that land and under that land, that same land, the subject of the uh, lease for the rice project, have been given away to the same developer. Um, if that is so, uh, Mr. Speaker, Acting Speaker, my view is that that may be wrong under our laws. It was a question that the Agriculture Minister was not able to fully answer. I have to qualify myself by saying that I will answer in the best and what I do understand. From my own understanding, that is not the case. I am not aware that in that agreement the state has given away its mining rights. I am not aware that in that agreement it has given away the oil and gas rights. I am sure that the state would not extinguish its rights. The state is too intelligent to allow that. The rice project is said to cost billions of kina and will take up around 100,000 hectares of land in Gabadi, central province. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. And some good news for traditional landowners of Woodluck Island. It was announced today in Parliament that Woodluck Island will now be recognized as customary land for the eight clans on the island. Minister for Lands, Benny Allen, made this announcement following questions from returned Samurai Morwa MP, Gordon Wesley. Woodluck Island uh, is an, an, an alienated uh, land, which means it's state land. And we have uh, uh, people on that island uh, who are courting or living on state land, and they belong to that island. And uh, our good Prime Minister directed us to work uh, uh, with the department uh, and uh, try to return the land to them. So it has taken a while, um, and uh, I'm happy to inform this House and, and also the, uh, the uh, Honourable Member that the declaration has been gazetted. Uh, declaration now has been gazetted and uh, we will now formally do a letter to Prime Minister informing that uh, the declaration of that land has been uh, done, gazetted, and the land will now be returned back to the uh, yeah. customary land owners. Um, there, are, there are eight clans uh, on the island, and the department has uh, started the process or has uh, identified eight land uh, owner groups or clan, then we will assist them to, to divide the land between the eight clans and have them uh, uh, registered under customary land registration. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill told Parliament today the government is at the centre of addressing mining-related issues. Prime Minister O'Neill said a formal statement will be released to address grievances by landowners in Hela and shares in Panguna and Oktedi. Assure this honourable house and our, our country that uh, uh, one thing is very obvious. Uh, that is that uh, we need to look after all our stakeholders. Uh, more importantly, the landowners and the provincial government and of course our citizens and our country. Uh, we need to have a greater stake, uh, stake in, the, uh, in the industry. And uh, industry laws today does not allow us to exercise uh, that option. So, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I want to assure you that... Uh, uh, we are looking at this in a very diligent manner. Uh, we want to be fair to everybody, including the investors. Mr. Speaker, without the investors, some of the large-scale mines like Frida and Wafi cannot be developed if we take up all the equity and the investors have got uh, no equity to take. But over the course of uh, uh, next two weeks, Mr. Speaker, I will be uh, making some uh, statements on this uh, house, uh, in this house uh, in regards to particularly... Uh, the shareholders in Oktedi and Bougainville. Uh, for the first time, these two mines have been controlled by Papua New Guineans. Uh, and of course, uh, in relation to the 4.27 uh, percentage uh, stakeholding by the landowners in, uh, in the Ela province uh, of, and of course the LNG project. 
Uh, I will make a separate statement uh, to this House on it, on it. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the uh, uh, good member that we will communicate with the industry. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the matter was discussed in Cabinet this morning, uh, but we have uh, uh, also uh, uh, deferred the discussion to uh, uh, next week because uh, I want to put a senior ministerial committee to, to discuss with other stakeholders on some of the concerns that have been raised. We have to iron out all these concerns before we bring the uh, legislation to this honourable house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Retail prices for rice in the country will increase in the coming weeks. Agriculture Minister Tommy Tomskol made this statement during Parliament today. Minister Tomskol says PNG is yet to reach the level of becoming an export-independent rice country. The Agriculture and Livestock Minister told the floor prices of rice is expected to climb given the circumstances of many rice-leading countries facing drought and the downturn in world economy. The Agriculture Minister made this known following questions raised by Kariku Hiri MP Peter Iso Aimo over the delay in the multi-million Gabadi rice project. We have received little or no um, um, advice on the status of the project and so it is appropriate I direct this question to the minister responsible to clear the air uh, on where uh, uh, the actual status of the project is. Rice has always remained a staple food for many Papua New Guineans. Minister Tomskol says the rise in price will definitely have an effect for many households. We are expecting a, a downturn in rice, which means uh, we should also be expecting a spike or increase in rice price. While the country makes efforts to grow local rice for consumption and export, the country continues to spend huge sum of money to import rice. Minister Tomskol says given the rise in price, importing will also be expensive. Meanwhile, the Gabadi rice project will be on hold following social mapping and other documents needed by the Agriculture Department. So the project is subject to those requirements of law that needs to be fulfilled. Jack Lapave, Junior National, MTV News. Rice company Trukai Industries has entered into a partnership with a lay-based helicopter company to provide medevac services for patients in rural areas of Morabe. The community service is called the True Care Program, which makes Trukai the first corporate organization to use an arrangement in Morabe. Since its inception in 2009, Manalos Aviation has been providing Medivac services through a joint program with the Morabe Provincial Government. The program aims at evacuating women in need of urgent medical attention due to pregnancy complications. This year's record from January to June shows a 95% success rate. The other five percent was lingered due to weather or not being able to locate patients during a flyover. But as far as pregnancy complications are concerned, most of them are in areas where, uh, where the health services in the district is not well established as yet. Through the True Care program, Truca Industries aims to maintain its support in ensuring proper health care reaches the people in the rural areas. The 65,000 kina given annually will go towards improving the medical equipment Manolos as We're looking at um, yeah, basic medical uh, equipment as, as to, yeah, to, to help with the, um, the, the chopper evacs. But Manolos Aviation CEO Yegen Ru said prior to employing a flying nurse, an average of two lives are lost yearly. The 65,000 kina we are getting from Trukai per year is to improve on the equipment we have, which starts from patient comfort uh, to uh, any other specialized equipment like fetal Doppler's. Since 2013, the Medivac program has lost only one mother, and out of the 140 flights Manalos Aviation does every year, one third of the mothers would have died if they have not been brought into Angau General Hospital for immediate treatment. Mata Lewis, National Lamp TV News, Lay. And now a look at the finance news. The Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0 0.3080 US dollars, 0 0.3995 Australian dollars, 0 0.2748 Euro, and 31.23 Japanese yen. 
Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee, cocoa and copper close the day lower. Palm oil closed higher, while crude oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed at 14 points lower, the ASX is trading at 41 points higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading 41 points higher. Here with National MTV News, we'll have more stories for you after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. A sentence will be handed down soon by Justice Penuel Mogish on three men involved in the rape of a woman in 2012. They are Lolo Bellamy, Hobai Kaharo and Dauba Kapini. Each have been convicted on four counts of aggravated rape. The maximum penalty for rape cases is life imprisonment. The trio's lawyer argued that the court should give a reasonable sentence based on the circumstance of the matter. He said no weapon was used and the three had no prior convictions. But the state lawyer argued that the court, in its own discretion, has a strong need to recognize the harm these men have done to the victim. The matter has been adjourned indefinitely, pending sentencing. The Medang Police Sea Patrol will now be back in full swing following the presentation of a new boat to police today. The boat is from the Medang Chamber of Commerce. Medang Provincial Police Commander, upon receiving the keys, said this will enable a new police unit to specifically attend to criminal activities at sea. Rachel Shisei with this report. The Medang Police will see a new unit specifically to be operating on the sea. This follows the presentation of a new banana boat and engine to the Medang Police by the Medang Chamber of Commerce today. President of the Medang Chamber of Commerce, Kevin Murray, said the boat is an help to ensure there is police presence on the sea as is on the land. Thank you, long PPC, long walk, long end, long line, long end, long making big people walk inside Long Harbour before, so stopping us with a heavy long Mikula inside the Medang town. Uh, now we got big people how much from Mikula Chamber of Commerce, Mikula handing them over key. So this is a nuclear dinghy, one time motor, to go on PTC or line long end now, or they can uh, make it again just for a walk. The Medang Provincial Police Commander, Superintendent Jacob Singura, upon receiving the boat ski, said that he is thankful to the authorities involved because this will now revive the Medang Police Sea Patrol. Another stepping stone, long walk long the police, to help him. All the easing down, there's the pressure, maybe the pine him, where maybe like no got one plus kind equipment or logistic support, maybe like the police, the Medang. So we talk with the Hamas once again to the Chamber of Commerce, to the Chairman, the Vice Chairman, and all those who have contributed one or the other. The Medang town area is closer to the sea, and most robberies that have happened last year have seen the robbers coming in and escaping by sea. With this new 23-foot banana boat and the 40 horsepower powered engine, a new police unit called the Medang Water Rats will now operate to attend to criminal activities on the sea. According to the Medang Chamber of Commerce President Kevin Murray, the 18,000 kina boat and engine was bought with the help of the Sumkar MP, Ken Fairweather, who chipped in 10,000 kina. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. The Israeli developer of an agriculture project in the Sirunki Valley of Enga province has begun the initial groundwork for the construction of storage and packing facilities, which will be part of the nucleus estate. In one year, the project will be producing vegetables for distribution throughout the country. The project, co-funded by the Enga provincial government, is expected to triple the incomes of households in the Sirunki Valley and other areas. The Israeli team from the innovative agro-industry company have begun clearing land for construction at Sirunki outside of the provincial capital. This is where the administration, packing and distribution will happen for the farm. This is my job to build here a center to collect all the vegetables and also to have a house for all the farmers to come to bring their product and also we are going to teach them uh, how to use the land 
and how to get from the land more and more beautiful things that the nature gave us. The concept is designed to have a nucleus farm built on state land at Sirunki, where the old Talum agriculture station used to be. The farm will produce various types of vegetables that thrive in the high altitude areas. The other portion of the required quota of vegetables will be produced by farmers who, who will already have a market to sell when the estate is in full operation. A year from now, you'll be uh, consuming the products from the Enga Sirunki Agro-Industrial Center. This is a 23 million kina investment by both the Enga provincial government and the company. The project will do two things double, maybe triple the household revenues and increase the level of food security in the region. Scott Waide, National MTV News. National Airports Corporation has been quick to reassure the general public that security at the Jackson's International Airport is not compromised and that they are working around the clock to ensure the safety of travelling passengers. This was done through a statement released today in response to a story made one of the dailies today about an alleged robbery that occurred at BSP's outlet at the International Airport Terminal last week. NAC's Acting Managing Director, Joseph Topiri, confirmed with MTV that a robbery did take place, but how much was taken and whether or not guns were used in the robbery could not be verified. While he was quoted as saying the CCTV cameras at the airport is not currently working, he said in the statement that information released by the paper was not vetted before it was published. Turning overseas now and roads were deserted and markets shuttered a day after one of the worst incidents of violence in a volatile region of Pakistan. A suicide bomber killed at least 70 people and wounded more than 100 yesterday in an attack on mourners who had gathered at a hospital in the city. Islamic State and a Taliban faction claimed responsibility. The bomb was struck as a crowd of mostly lawyers and journalists crammed into the emergency department to accompany the body of a prominent lawyer who had been shot and killed in the city earlier in the day. Senior government officials said at least 70 people had been killed and more than 112 wounded. Islamic State's Ayama Q News Agency said IS was behind the atrocity, claiming that a martyr from the Islamic State detonated his explosive belt at the gathering. Jamalera, a faction of the Islamic militant Pakistani Taliban group, earlier said it had carried out the attack. The movement at one time swore fealty to Islamic State's Middle East leadership, but later switched back to the Taliban. Only last week, Jamahad was added to the United States' list of global terrorists, triggering sanctions. Whoever was behind the attack, Quetta residents blamed the government for negligence. The White House condemned the attack and says it remains resolute in joining with the people of Pakistan in confronting terrorism in Pakistan and across the region. The motive behind the attack is unclear, but several lawyers have been targeted during a recent spate of killings in Quetta, the provincial capital of Baluchistan, which has a history of militant and separatist violence. The latest victim, Bilal Anwar Kasi, was shot and killed while on his way to the city's main court complex. He was the president of Baluchistan Bar Association. A spokesman for the Baluchistan government has said the subsequent suicide attack appeared to target its mourners. The attack was the deadliest in Pakistan since an Easter Day bombing ripped through Lahore Park, killing at least 72 people. Quetta has long been regarded as a base for the Afghan Taliban, whose leadership has regularly held meetings there in the past. In May, Afghan Taliban leader Mullah Akta Mansa was killed by a U.S. drone strike while traveling to Quetta from the Pakistan-Iran border. Lorraine Gabina, MTV World News. And that ends our news segment. After these messages, is Trukai Sports. We'll have some updates from the Rio Olympics. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Right. 
Welcome to Trukai Sports. Papua New Guinea's Ryan Pini will mark his fourth Olympic Games appearance on Thursday when he plunges into the pool with some of the world's best swimmers, including American icon Michael Phelps and South Africa's Chad Leclos. Pini will compete in the men's 100-meter butterfly, the same event that landed him his first gold medal at the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne in 2006. Although humbled in his fourth and could be his final appearance for PNG in the Olympics, Ryan Pinney has but one goal in mind, to give his best for his country, PNG. When he takes a dip into the pool against the world's best at the Olympics Aquatic Center on Thursday. Pinney went through some regular training with his coach, Ricky Van de Zent. Pinney, 34, will be up against some of the big names in the aquatics world and most notable American living icon, Michael Phelps. The most decorated athlete in Olympic history, Michael Phelps now has a record of 23 career medals and counting. Another big name South African swimmer and Olympic silver medalist in 200 meter freestyle, Chad Lee Claus, and Frenchman Jeremy Stravers, also the Olympic silver medalist in 4x100 meter freestyle relay. Ryan's 100 meter butterfly heat will be on Friday morning, 3.15 a.m and will be telecast live on MTV. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. To football and Nigel Dabinyaba added a touch of international class to Western Pride's win over Morton Bay United at Briggs Road Sporting Complex. The PNG international striker forced several saves from Jets keeper Matt Stein before Mitchell Bird found the back of the net. Western Pride went on to win 1-0. Dabin Yaba joined Pride from Lay City Dwellers, where he won this year's Papua New Guinea National Soccer League Championship. He left last month to join Western Pride in Australia, which is a first division club that competes in the National Premier League. In June, he scored three times in PNG's run to the OFC Nations Cup Grand Final, where a fairy tale finish was only saddened in a penalty shootout by regional heavyweights New Zealand. Still going, Simi! Good save by Sokovi, it might not be enough, it's not! Nigel Damanyaba! And he receives the congratulations of his teammates. Western Pride coach Graham Harvey was a keen observer of the tournament and said he had been impressed by Dabin Yaba. Pride has been developing close ties the Oceania region with the club having played both PNG and New Zealand national teams at the Briggs Road Sporting Complex in the past two years. Dabi Nyaba is believed to be the first current international in the history of the Queensland National Premier League's competition. He is also the second capped international to play for Pride after foundation coach and ex soccer Casey Wehrman fielded himself in a handful of games. Elijah Lavet, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Krukai Sports after these messages. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. To an update on the PNG Games, it is now confirmed that Team Central will participate in 18 codes of the 24 available at the PNG Games in November. Provincial Sports Coordinator Henry Cavana said there is a men's and women's team in place for every code, except for netball and rugby nines. Dean Rose Raiko with more. Most of the 18 codes have already done train on team selections and minor changes will be made as the team's training in individual codes progress. The first training camp for all ball games was held at Mirigeta on the 10th to the 15th of July where final selections were made to complete the entries by name as required by the games committee. Teams that went through the process were volleyball, basketball, soccer, touch footy, rugby nines and netball. We are from the rural areas and uh, we, we want to play at our rural uh, what, uh, settings. Uh, we also want to, uh, the, uh, the Central Province people to take ownership of the team as they go into their what, uh, respective training centres in the districts. Um, our strategy now is to play against uh, some of our uh, known teams in the province. Um, for example, like I stated earlier uh, in the meeting that... Uh, Meanwhile, athletics have conducted two trials and the final will be held on the 18th to the 20th of this month at the Cedron Guys Stadium. Taekwondo have the team in place and training is ongoing at the Taurama Aquatic Center. With NCDC 7th team already in place, Central 7th team is yet to submit names and training schedules. Kavana stressed lead-up games are fundamental and urges all codes to do so in order to keep fit. 
He added, with the team going rural, team preparations are progressing, but considering the locations players are coming from for training, financial support is crucial when bringing them to training locations. Actually, we are, we are actually not uh, so keen of uh, conducting our training in the city. We are from the rural areas and uh, we, we want to train at our rural uh, what, uh, settings. Uh, we also want to, uh, the, uh, the central province people to take ownership of the team as they go into their what, uh, respective training centres in the districts. Um. At the moment, most of the teams are utilising whatever grounds they have for training and all are not based in the city. Central teams preparation have three phases, team selections, training and games proper, which most codes are in the second and third phase. Dini Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. To snooker, a billiards and snooker referees course will be conducted in Port Moresby next week. Adam Weird from the Australia Billiards and Snooker Association will conduct a week-long course starting Monday. Apart from being tournament director of various Australian Open Championships and Oceania titles, Weird is familiar with PNG as he was the tournament director when PNG hosted the Oceania Billiards and Snooker Championships in Port Moresby in 2009 and again in 2013. We had arrived in Port Mosby on Sunday and the course starts the next day at the Lamana Q Club. To cricket and the Lewas are now into the second week of training after a week's rest from the successful East Asia Pacific qualifiers in Samoa. In preparation for the World Cup qualifiers, the next seven months will be dedicated to the Lewas intensive training. Maha said the competition in the World Cup qualifiers is expected to be a lot tougher than the East Asia Pacific qualifiers. The Lewis now have four days a week training at the Tarama Aquatic Centre and the Lewis home ground, Amini Park, and that includes skills and fitness to better the performance. After observing the team's successful performance in Samoa, Maha is looking at pushing the team further to heighten the game in order to be able to play at world standard. We have Two days of skill and two days of fitness. And it might change depending on uh, how close we are to uh, the tournaments. And also, in between, we possibly might have uh, um, short tours, uh, lead up matches uh, in Australia. Meanwhile, the Lewis will meet Australia in two friendlies before the World Cup qualifiers in England. At the moment, most of the team members are participating in the Palm Cricket Competition and are attending Lewis training on the scheduled days. In-house friendlies will eventuate at Amini Park after Palm Cricket winds down in September. Dini Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. And there in Strukai Sports for tonight. Don't go anywhere. We'll have your weather details for the next 24 hours when we return. Strukai Sports. Strukai Sports. Taking a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region, fine weather in Port Moresby with a top temperature of 28 degrees, mostly fine in Daru, Kerama, Alatar, Popandeta, a top of 31. To the Momasi region, a shower or two expected in Leh and Wau, thundery showers in Medang, showers in Wiwek and Banimore. To the New Guinea Islands region, some showers are expected in Lorangau, a shower or two in Kavian, Kokopo and Rabaul, a shower or two as well in Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, some showers are expected in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, brief showers over the next 24 hours. A look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. There is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Papua New Guinea, except for Medang to Bogia, Wiwak, Aitape, Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island, Kerama, Yul Island, Hood Point to Samurai Island with waters of Finchafen through Vitya Strait, CRC Islands to Long Island and with waters of West New Britain, seas 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Eastern and Western Milan Bay Islands and with waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel and Finchafen, seas 2 to 3 meters. Waters west of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Wiwak, Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border, seas 0.5 to 1.3 meters. 
waters of Manus and its western group of islands and with waters of New Island to East New Britain and Bougainville sees 1.5 to 2.5 meters. And a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas. Coral Sea, sea is rather rough with southeasterly winds at 20 to 25 knots. Solomon Sea, sea is moderate to rough with southeasterly winds at 20 to 34 knots. Bismarck Sea, sea is slight to rather rough with southeasterly winds at 15 to 25 knots. And the Pacific Ocean, sea is slight with southwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Before we go, the opposition has called on the government to address issues raised by LNG landowners in Hela. Opposition leader Don Polier said the demands are genuine and the government must respond positively. Polier made this statement in today's parliament session. Straight after parliament today, the opposition LDA press conference calling on the government to address matters surrounding the LNG project. Opposition leader Don Polia gave a short statement calling on the government to act now. The national government need to meet the requirements of this agreement in paying up what has been outstanding for quite some time. Former Petroleum and Energy Minister Ben Micah, while outlining the agreement signed in Kokopo for the UBSA and LBBSA, said the landowners are our people and the government must pay what is due for taking out the resource. Cabinet has already dealt with my recommendations. And cabinet must now move to implement their NEC decisions to settle uh, those uh, payments, uh, royalties or IDGs that are due. The former opposition bans raised concerns following threats and current situation up at Heights gas plants and in the PDL7 area. This must be a terrible hoax for them to go and sign off agreements thinking that they will receive what is rightfully theirs. And all of a sudden realize that they have to overcome countless hurdles and obstacles along the way. And it's rather unfortunate that we're in a situation like this. And I just, I'm, I'm pleading on behalf of the uh, opposition. We would like to encourage the government to make those payments immediately. Meanwhile, Deputy Opposition Leader Sam Basil criticized the government for not debating issues of concern outlining Parliament's order of the day. Among issues the Bulolo MP raised was the ICAC bill. Opposition. People come law, sit down in parliament, and we've, we've only used up one hour of our time today, which is a waste, and the rest of the day has gone to waste. So, Parliament will resume tomorrow at 10 a.m. Jack Lapave, Junior National, MTV News. And that's the new sports and weather for tonight. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, you have a pleasant viewing on MTV. Good night.